In the 
Go ahead and stand with me, please, if you would. We will go to the Lord in prayer before we proceed on with the message. Father in heaven, as we approach thy throne of grace in prayer now at this time, Lord God, we ask, first of all, for forgiveness, Lord, for where we have sinned against thee and failed thee. Father, it seems that even as Christians that our hearts can be so deceptive, Lord God, and so deceitful. Father, we ask forgiveness for the times that we have gone through selfish seasons where we think more of ourselves than we do of thee. Father, thou hast promised us in thy word that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. And Father, the truth is that so oftentimes our minds are not stayed upon thee as they should be. Father, there are times that our minds will wander out into a multitude of different things, sometimes into things of the world and sometimes, Lord God, even into things of our service here in the church, Lord, that we will become so consumed with even serving Thee, Father, and we fail to have our minds and our affections upon Thee as we should. Father, it is my prayer this day that Thou would arrest our attention. And Father, help us to be able to focus solely and intently upon Thy Word as it goes forth this day. And Father, I know that in and of myself that I have nothing good that I can do to or for any person here, including myself. And Lord God, we are fully dependent upon the working of thy spirit in the midst of this assembly if anything good is to be accomplished. We pray, Father, and ask of thee once again to meet with us now through the preaching of thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Ever since Adam and Eve were put out of the Garden of Eden something we seldom see in the lives of the people of God during Bible times is much of a settling down. If we think about Abraham, he was called out of Ur of the Chaldees. So many of the people, it seemed like that they were always on the go, many of the Lord's people. Just about the only time that they were in one place for very long was if they had a job to do or if they were in bondage or captivity. With the exception of Old Testament kings and that during peacetime or guarding the city. It seemed like they were always on the go. In other words, the grass seldom ever grew under their feet because they were always in transition. Moving on up the New Testament times, the one who created all things and even owned the cattle on a thousand hills said of himself, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If we think about the Lord Jesus Christ Himself while He was here upon this earth, to be honest, it seemed like that for the 30 years that He was here, we don't really see Him settling down. In other words, I'm, we don't see Him coming to a place that He said, you know what, I'm just going to hang out here for four or five years and I'm going to kind of let, let serving or service go on hold for a while and I'm just going to kind of hang tough here for a period of time. But instead, the whole time that Christ was here, He was always busy serving other people. Constantly on, the, constantly on the go, serving other people. The apostles and many of the ancient Christians were also constantly on the move. Look with me to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. And the Bible says there in Hebrews chapter number 11, beginning in verse number 36, the Bible says of the early Christians there, and others had trial of cruel mockings, and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Now, before we move on to the next verse, how would it be for you folks if, if someone is considering membership here at Bryan Station Baptist Church and, and you say, well, what is it like at Bryan Station Baptist Church? What, what can we expect at Bryan Station? I mean, after we move our membership there, will life be a piece of cake? I mean, will there be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain as soon as we move our membership there? How would you feel if we were to take and tell you uh, that you will have a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. How would you feel, even if you're thinking about, if you say, you know, I'm thinking about becoming a Christian. Maybe I would like to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What may I expect if I choose to follow Christ as my Lord and Savior? And we were to take and give you these descriptions. In verse number 37, the Bible says they were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword... They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. How would you like that if we print that up as a brochure 
for what you may look forward to if you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, the reason, of course, for all of these things, the reason was due to persecution. And the message today is not, not to say that it is wrong for Christians to own a home or settle down. What I'm trying to get across this morning is that as we look at the Old Testament people, as we look at the New Testament people, we seldom ever see them come to a place of rest for very long, physically speaking, if you will. And once again today, I'm not saying that it's wrong to own a home or to settle down to a certain extent, but rather to show that spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we as Christians, we are on a journey. In other words, we have not yet arrived to our destination. We are on a journey, if you will. And also, we also see this many times in songs that have been written, Christian songs. Songs such as, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Now, I don't know, I, I realize many of you folks have no doubt traveled, but if I'm out traveling someplace to another state and I need to stop at a rest area and, and, and use the restroom or whatever, I don't go into the restroom and sit there and say, you know what, I, I think I'm going to order a Lazy Boy and have it delivered here. I think I'm going to order some new tile for the wall. I think I'm going to see about having this place here painted, or I think I'm going to see about having it decorated with a little bit different fashion. And the reason that I don't consider those things is because I know I'm not going to be there long. It's not my intent to spend much time there. In other words, I'm only there for a moment and then I'm moving on. You see, beloved, we as Christians, we're also on a journey. Once again, songwriters will write songs, This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Another song that has been written, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. In other words, there's progress being made. They're pressing on. It is not that they're taking and putting down roots here, but they're pressing on. Another song that has been written, On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Another song that had been written, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. You see, beloved, our entire time upon the face of this earth, and it is not to say that it's wrong to, to be comfortable in your dwelling. I, I'm not promoting that at all. I'm not saying we should all sell our homes and move underneath a bridge just to endure hardness more so. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable while we're here, but the problem can enter in if we're not careful when we come to the place that we begin to develop the idea that this world is somewhat of our home. This world is where we will be spending a great deal of our time. Because you see, beloved, our lives here upon this earth, they're very temporal, if you will, to say the least. I believe that this was the thought being expressed by the Spirit of God. If you look with me in your Bibles to so Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 10. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says there in, the, in Philippians chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. You know, beloved, there are many times that we as Christians, we will compartmentalize or we will segregate ourselves from the apostles, if you will. In other words, there are times in our lives that we as Christians, we will read about the apostle Paul and his great passion to know the Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. There are times that we as Christians, we will look at that and we will take and say, well, that's for the, if, the other class of Christians, if you will. That's for the other half. That's how the other half live. In other words, there are some people that they're so sold out, they're so dedicated in their service, Lord, and that's how they live. But for me personally, I have my own little comfort zone, and I, I, I appreciate Paul's fervor. I appreciate Paul's zeal. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to entering into the fellowship of his suffering, if I can just kind of skate by while I'm here on this earth, and not have to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings, that would suit me just fine. Beloved, how much do we really want to know the Lord? How much do we truly want to know him? He says there in verse number 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. In verse number 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Practically speaking, I believe that the Apostle Paul 
was much more spiritual than any of us here today, practically speaking. I don't say that just as far as him being an apostle, and I don't say that he was more saved than we are. I'm not saying he was more complete in Christ than we are, because as a Christian, he was just as saved as we are today, or possibly I should say, we are just as saved as he was. In other words, it's not possible for one person to be saved more than another, but when it comes to our personal consecration, if you will, our desire to be like Christ, if you will, I believe that Paul had the attitude, you know what, I don't care if they kill me, I will serve God, no matter what the cost. I believe that this was the attitude of many of the early Christians. The Bible tells in the book of Acts, men who have hazarded their lives and yet it seemed like that if we're not careful, we Christians in our day and age, that we kind of, we're, we're a little bit content to ha kind of have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We're kind of content to take and say, well, I, of course I'm sold out to Christ. But I mean, if you'd start talking about me actually having to literally give my life, I mean, I don't mind giving a Sunday morning. I don't mind giving a Sunday night. I don't even mind giving a Wednesday night. But I mean, if you want to talk about me actually having to literally and physically lay down my life for the cause of Christ, I'm just not on that level of spirituality, if you will. Beloved, I don't know about you folks, but I somewhat envy the Apostle Paul and the things that they had seen the Lord do in their midst. The things they had seen the Lord do in their midst. In other words, I envy people sometimes that, that I count to be super spiritual people, and yet we must realize at the same time that the reason that we are not more where they are now, I'm not talking about apostolic gifts, but the reason that we are not where they are is simply because we choose not to be there. Right. Our lack of sanctification, personal sanctification, it's not because the Lord is slacking off on the job. It's not because we're so hard-headed that the Spirit cannot move and work in us. In other words, we cannot blame the Lord. We cannot blame His Spirit if we're not more committed, more sanctified to the Lord than we are. But rather, we only have ourselves to blame. The Apostle Paul, when he considered himself, he says, not as though I had already attained. In other words, Paul realized there's still work to go. There's still ground to cover in my service to the Lord. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. You know, beloved, it seems like that if we were to go around and ask Christians today, right here in our very auditorium, are you perfect? Now, we're not talking about the positional sense of salvation, if you're here today and you're saved, you're perfect in the sight of Christ. But what I'm talking about, if you will, is the practical aspect of sanctification. And it seemed like that there are times that we come to the place that we take and kind of feel like, well, I, you know, I, of course I wouldn't admit out loud that I'm perfect. But to be honest, I didn't see much more sense to strive for personal holiness or spirituality because I feel like I've arrived. Of course, I wouldn't tell others that because that would sound boastful or proud or arrogant. But I just kind of feel like I've arrived. I feel like I've come to the place in my spiritual life that I can look at other people and maybe even look down on them a little bit because I feel like I have arrived. You see, none of us would take and say that we're perfect, but oftentimes the attitude that we convey in our quest for spirituality is one that we feel kind of like we have arrived. There's no more pressing forward of you. Let me tell you folks something. If the Apostle Paul had the attitude that he had not yet arrived, if the Apostle Paul had the attitude that he had not yet attained, if that was the Apostle Paul's thinking, how much more should it be our thinking to realize that none of us have yet arrived? And if you're here today, I don't care if you're a member of the church, visitor of the church, if you're here today and you feel like that spiritually speaking, in your personal commitment, guys, I've arrived. There's no more striving to do. He said, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. What is that all about? Service. A quest for the Lord. He says in verse number 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. 
Paul, what are you talking about? I mean, look at all the things that you've done, Paul. Look at the people that you've healed. Look at all the books that you've written, literally books of the Bible. Look at the way the Spirit of God has used you and your service to Him. And you're saying that you don't feel like you've apprehended yet? You don't yet feel like that you've arrived? Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind... And reaching forth unto those things which are before. Beloved, I wonder today how much reaching is taking place in the lives of the Lord's people today. I'm not talking about reaching out for things of this life or things of this world. And, and once again, there's nothing wrong with that. Wanting a, a nice house or a dependable car, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is that in our personal life, in the very core of our being, how much reaching is really taking place? You know, the funny thing about it is that years ago, I used to see people that would walk by a penny on the ground. And I don't know if it was a pharisaic attitude, but sometimes I think, you know what, I, that, that person, they looked right at that penny, or maybe they drop a penny. And then they didn't bend over to pick it up. And, and sometimes I would sit there and think, man, either they're rich or sometimes I'd have a Pharisee. Why did it, maybe they're just kind of, uh, they, they feel like that they have arrived. Well, boy, they, they're so rich, they don't need that penny that they dropped or that dime that they dropped. Now here's the funny side of the story. I used to pick up every penny that I would see on the ground. But you know what? As I get older and my back hurts more, Sometimes now when I see a penny, I say, man, I'm sorry, it's just not worth the pain. It's not worth the struggle. It hurts when I bend over. I'll, I'll leave that for someone else. And it's not that I don't need the penny, but as I weigh the benefits, as I sit there and I say, you know what, if I bend over to pick it up, it's going to hurt my back. And so therefore, I think as I weigh the benefits of the, the pain compared to the value of the penny, I say, leave the penny there. And you see, beloved, the problem is that sometimes we as Christians, we will begin to weigh the benefits. We will take and say, you know what? I could have better consecration or greater consecration, a greater drive or a greater desire to serve the Lord. But as I consider the cost of it, I don't know if it's really worth it. As I consider the things that it will cost me, whether it's something as simple as Bible reading and prayer time, whether it is something as simple as setting aside a portion of our day to meditate upon the Lord, to tune out all of the things of this life. Beloved, I believe that meditation upon the Lord and things of the Lord is something greatly lacking in our day. For you will go into a quiet room and you're not there necessarily to offer your petitions up before the Lord and give Him your wish list. But where you go into a quiet room and you turn the TV off, you turn your phone off, you remove all distractions and you sit there and say, I'm going to focus upon the Lord and the Lord alone for the next, it can be 30 seconds, it can be five minutes. But you know what? We're all so busy. Sometimes we will have the attitude, you know what? If I would go in there and get alone with the Lord for five minutes and turn my phone off, I mean, I might miss something important. Really? And what could possibly be more, be more important than meditating upon the Lord for a period of time? Beloved, we all get so busy. The Apostle Paul says there once again in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul realized that he had not yet arrived. You see, beloved, there's a part in many Christians in which we grow weary in the journey. There's a part in many Christians that we may look back and say, you know what, I remember in years gone by that I was, I was closer to the Lord. My walk with the Lord was more sweet, if you will. It was more intimate in years gone by. But I just, to be honest, I've got to the point that I'm tired. I've come to the point in my life that after all of that time, I'm just quite literally tired, to be honest with you. There's a part in us as we grow weary in the journey especially for those who have been traveling for a while, a part of us that just wants to lay down our back to pa backpack and unlace our boots and take and say, ah, I'm finished. I'm done. Look with me in your Bibles to Numbers chapter number 32. Numbers chapter number 32. 
The Bible says here in Numbers chapter number 32, beginning in verse number 1, Now the children of Reuben, Numbers chapter number 32, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers chapter number 32, beginning in verse number 1, Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle, and when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold the place was a place for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Atroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Elela and Shebam and Nebo and beyond, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Let me ask you all something. If you had a thousand head of cows and you were on the go, and all of a sudden over here on one hand there's a lot of sand and a lot of desert land, and over here on the other land there's on the other hand there's a grassy grass many grassy fields, which way would it make more sense to go? Which way would it make more sense to go? I don't know about you folks, but I would think the grassy land. The cows eat grass. Amen? But you see, beloved, the wisdom of this world and logic such as that, in other words, what I'm saying is when the Bible tells us, lean not unto thine own understanding, in their mind they had the attitude, you know what, Moses? Thy servants have cattle, and this is a land that's good for cattle. And they knew full good and well that it was not yet the promised land. They knew that there were still battles to fight. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore said they, If we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. They have wandered for years and years and years. And they came to the place, they said, you know what? We, we know, I mean, we've all heard about crossing over Jordan. We've all heard about the promised land, the land that flows with milk and, funny, that milk and honey. We've all heard about what God has prepared for us up ahead. But just to be honest with you, Moses, we're tired. We're tired of the journey, and we kind of feel like, you know what? We have our cattle right here. We have grassy land right here. And you know what? It may not be the promised land, but it will do. And for us, we just want to settle down for a while, Moses. Beloved, it's easy for us to look at these men and pass judgment on them and take and say, How dare you? But, beloved, I wonder honestly, if we as Christians were to be honest with ourselves today, how many of us have come to the point that we will sit back and we will take and say, you know what, I know that we have not yet arrived, but I am so weary in the journey. I know that there are still advancements that I should be striving for. I know that there's still a mark that I should be pressing for. But just to be very honest with you, I'm tired. I'm tired of pressing for that mark. I've pressed for that mark. Some of you for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I've pressed for that mark. And I've pressed and I've pressed and I've pressed and I still haven't arrived. But I've come to the place that I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. And to be honest, I'm not going to press anymore. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to coast for the rest of my journey into heaven. We have wandered and wandered and wandered in the promised land. We have buried Aaron. We have buried a lot of our friends. We have fought many battles. And we feel like we just want to settle down. We know that this is not the place that the Lord's promised for us. But it's good enough. The Bible tells once again... Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. The people here, they were willing to forfeit God's best that he had for them. The Lord already had the promised land all prepared for them and they were willing to take and lean to their own understanding and forfeit the promised land just in order to have peace and contentment in their lives. They thought peace and contentment. 
They were basing all of their future and their children's future upon the fact that they would have food for their cows. Let me ask you folks the question this morning. How many of you have ever been there? You feel like, you know what? I come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and I'm putting my time in. I bring my Bible, and I open it when you give us a passage to look to. When we sing a song, I open the book, and I sing a song. And you know what? I'm doing what I need to be doing. I'm going through the motions. But as far as striving for anything else, as far as really looking or seeking for a meeting with God, I've sought one and sought one and sought one, and I'm tired, and I just don't care anymore. Beloved, I fear that there are times that we reach these points in our walk with the Lord. We know that this is not the promised land, but we're tired and we have the attitude that it will do. We have the attitude, while this may not be the mark that I've been pressing for for years, it will do. There are times that we may come up with the attitude, you know what, you don't understand what it's like, Brother Spears. This is a lie straight out of the pits of hell that there are times that, there, that we will come to the place that we will blame our apathy and we will say, well, you know what, you don't know what it's like, the things I've been struggling with. You don't know what it's like, the things that I've been through. So therefore, I'm just going to go ahead and sit back on my laurels and not do anything whatsoever. Trust the Lord for the rest of the trip. There's no more need for me to strive. I've striven enough. Beloved, there is a test for each of you to take today to find out if you've striven enough yet or not. Here's the test. Take your right hand and put it over here on your left wrist and see if you still feel something there in your wrist. Now hopefully you will feel a heartbeat And if you don't, Brother Randall, bring the defibrillator down. Amen? If you still feel a heartbeat there in your left wrist, then there's still the mark to be pressed for. You can't sit back now. You cannot come to the point that you coast. Beloved, I fear that maybe some of you are here now to the point that you feel like, you know what, I just want to quit for a while. I just want to rest for a while. This may not be the mark that I've been striving for, but it will do. And I'm not talking about people leaving the faith. I'm not talking about those who profess to be Christians going out and turning into bank robbers and, and stuff like that tomorrow. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that we get backslidden in the pew. Yep, you have your Sunday year to meet and close on. Yep, you have your Sunday go to meet and shoes on. Yep, you dusted off the old Bible this morning. Yep, you open the hymn book. You can check all those off. But in the depths and confines of your heart, you're backslidden in the pew. You tell me I'm backslidden. I'm here in church. How dare you tell me I'm backslidden? I'm not telling that you're backslidden. What I'm saying is examine yourself. And are you still pressing for the mark, if you will? We come to the place that we have the attitude, I'm just going to hunker down. After this much time in battle, I just want to go ahead and at least take part of my inheritance now because I feel like that I have earned it. Look with me in your Bibles to Galatians, chapter number 6 and verse number 9. The Bible says here in Galatians, chapter number 6 and verse number 9. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 9. The Bible gives us very clear cut instructions there. And let us not be weary in well doing. You know what, beloved? There's also a lie that comes from the devil. That there are times that we will reach the point that we feel like, you know what, if we're doing well, there wouldn't be any weariness involved. Let me tell you something. There is weariness involved in well-doing. Maybe you say, well, Brother Spears, I disagree with that. I don't believe that there's weariness in well-doing. Well, then you need to have a little talk with the Lord and tell Him we really didn't need this verse in the Bible. The Bible says there once again, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Beloved, I wonder how many of us are weary today. How many of us have come to the point that we've just kind of laid aside our gear and now we're laid back taking it easy. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
You see, beloved, God is the one who controls the seasons when they come and when they go. And He is also the one who determines when the due season is. Some of you men who are hunters here, maybe you feel like, you know what, I think deer season should come in a day earlier, go out a day later. Won't be long, amen? But you know what, there are people who they say that they know what's going on and they've studied the deer and they kind of take and say, well, you know what, this is the time that they ought to be hunted. You ought to be able to hunt from this time to this time. And that's the best all around. That's what they say. Now, I don't know if they always know what they're talking about or not, but you know what? When our Lord and God up in heaven, when He appoints the seasons, when they come and when they go, I know that He is always right with His appointments of the seasons, if you will. He's always right. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Possibly you're here and you're on the verge of fainting, if you will. Spiritual fainting is a choice, and it is a choice made by you. It's a choice. If you're here today and you feel like, you know, I, I feel like I've fainted spiritually. I feel like it's been a day ago, a year ago, 20 years ago that I've kind of laid my gear aside. I quit pressing for the mark. I quit reaching for it. And I'm not really pressing. I'm just kind of here floating along now, just going through the motions, if you will. Brother Spears, won't I get to heaven if I just kind of roll on and go with the flow? If you're a child of God, you'll get to heaven. But I'll tell you what, you'll be ashamed before Him. You'll be ashamed. Beloved, spiritual fainting, once again, it is a choice. And if you choose to faint spiritually, then it is because you choose to do so. What I mean is that God gives to us all that we need to run the race. And if we fail or faint, it is never because the Lord has ill-equipped us. But rather, it's because of the way that we have chosen to live our lives. Beloved, make no mistake about it. God has given to us all that we need to live the kind of life that is pleasing in His sight, but it is a matter of us being willing to do so. The Bible tells in Isaiah chapter number 40, in verse number 31, a verse that many of you hopefully have memorized. The Bible says there in Isaiah chapter number 40, in verse number 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, beloved, is the Bible true? We would all say, yes, Brother Spears, of course the Bible's true. If the Bible be true, then the Bible says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Maybe you're here this day and you're weary in the battle. You're weary in the fight. And you feel like, I I'm just too tired to go on. Then wait upon the Lord. And what does the Bible say will happen if you will wait upon the Lord? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Brother Spears, how long do I have to wait upon the Lord? The verse doesn't tell us that part. But it says, wait upon the Lord. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Beloved, the thing about it is, is when we come to the place... I don't know how many people have this problem, but there are times that I will feel like if I have a large job ahead of me, and I'll feel like, you know what, I'm tired. And to be honest, sometimes I get a little bit shaky, it seems like sometimes. But I may feel kind of tired, and I'll feel shaky, and I'll think, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead, and I, I don't, I'm just going to press on, and I'm going to finish the job. And to be honest, if my wife knew what I was going through, she'd probably take and say, honey, sit down, take a break, let me bring you a glass of tea and, and some, a snack. But sometimes I'll feel like, you know what, the sun's going down and I'm going to get this done. Now watch me drop over dead over a pile of firewood sometime this week, amen. But sometimes I'll have the idea, I'm going to get this done if it kills me. I'm not going to take a break. I don't have the time to take a break. I don't have time to do that. You know what, there are many people that they have the attitude in their service, Lord, I don't have time to wait upon God. You say, Brother Spears, what kind of person would have that attitude? King Saul did when he was waiting on Samuel. I don't have time to wait upon Samuel to come over here. I'm going to go ahead and take matters in my own hands. You know what, beloved, if you're here today and you're fainting, if you're here today and you're weak, if you're here today and you're spiritually exhausted, you're tired, there's a strong possibility that you have run ahead of the Lord rather than waiting upon Him. 
Sometimes when my children were young, it used to be maybe they would take and say, I'd say this is a heavy object over here and it needs to be moved and there's a specific way that it needs to be moved. There's a way that we can move this object and it will be a lot easier if we do it the way that I know how to do it. And maybe the boys take and say, Dad, we've got this. We can move this. It's no problem. And there are times that I will take and say, okay, you've got this. You don't want to know the way that I already know how to move this and it's a much easier job? No, we've got this. Sometimes I'll step back and say, go ahead. Go ahead. You think you got this? Go ahead. Maybe you say, Brother Spears, that's mean. No, it's not mean. It's a teaching tool. Some of you here today, beloved, we come to the point that we take and say, you know what? I've got this. All the Christian life, I've got this. Yes, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. But I don't have to wait upon the Lord. I've got this. And there are times that the Lord will allow us to get more and more exhausted, more and more tired, more and more weary, because we're not casting all of our burdens upon Him. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, the Bible says. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You see, beloved, when you attempt to run ahead of the Lord, you wind up weary and exhausted. He promises you no strength for that section of the race that you're running ahead of Him in. You will not be guided by His Spirit because you have run ahead of Him. There are times, beloved, that we must be willing to wait upon the Lord. There's a song, when the battle is over, we will wear a crown. I like the expression better, when the battle is over, we will gain a reward. But not until then. Be faithful this day, beloved, in your service to the Lord. Look with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says there, Revelation chapter 3 in verse number 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. The Lord knew them. The Lord knew that they had a name. They had a reputation, if you will. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. He goes on to say there in verse number 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Beloved, there are times that we love the sovereignty of God so much that it tends to make us lazy, to be quite honest with you. The Lord tells them, be watchful. We may have the attitude, why do I have to be watchful? The Lord's in control. I don't have to be watchful. That's God's job. No, it's not. When He tells you about a certain area of your life, be watchful, then it's your responsibility to be watchful. And if you fail at being watchful, then you will suffer the consequences of that. Be watchful, the Bible says, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse number 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. You know, I don't know about you folks. My dad, he always made us work hard when we were kids growing up. I know some people today feel like that that's the death of America for young people to have to work hard, that that's what's destroying America. I believe it's kind of silly. But I'll tell you what, if my dad gave us a job to do, and maybe it would be a two-hour job, and he would go away, and he would be gone for eight or ten hours, maybe we would goof off for a while, and we would have a good time in his absence. But when we would realize that his car was pulling in the driveway and the job was not yet done, it would rattle us in our hearts. Because we would know I had ample time to complete the task that was assigned to me, but I chose not to do it. I chose instead to goof off. I chose instead to go swimming in the creek, swinging on grapevines. I chose to do everything else but the job which he had assigned to me. And because of that, now he's here, and I have to face him. 
I'll tell you what, beloved, my dad was nothing compared to what it will be like when we stand before the Lord. My dad was but a man. But one day I fear that when we stand before the Lord that we will have that feeling times a million. He says there in verse number 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Verse number 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Beloved, once again, maybe you're here this day and you're weary. You're tired in the journey. Maybe you feel like, I just want to go ahead and take part of my inheritance here. I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I'm trusting the Lord for salvation, but I'm so weary and I'm so tired. And to be quite honest, I'm tired of waiting on the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and kick back and relax. While we were there in Virginia, we hiked up to a point in the mountain called McAfee Point. Funny thing is, I ended up with blisters on my feet because there's a, a thing that hikers will oftentimes tell you, and that thing is, you never hike in new boots. You just don't do it. You don't hike in new boots. Well, you know what Brent did? Brent found a pair of boots. They were so nice, so soft, so pliable, that I thought, you know what, I'm above that advice. I mean, look at me. Do I look like I need that goofy little rule that they put forth, never hike in new boots? It was about five miles to get to the top. And after we'd been on the trail for about the first mile, I developed bad blisters on my left foot. We were still on the way up, not on the way back. And you know, the thing that kept going through my mind is the family is going to be up there on top of McAfee Point and they will all have their pictures taken and to be honest, in my heart, I just wanted to stop and say, you guys go on ahead without me. I'm not going to make the trip. My foot hurts. But instead, I kept thinking, no, I'm going to do it. The first mile or two, I had a bad blister on my left foot. The next mile or two, I had a bad blister on my right foot. And I was starting to walk like Frankenstein, kind of like this. It was miserable. You know what, never in my life have I realized as much as I did there during that time the importance of just one more step. Just one more step. Just one more step is all I need to take. Every time hikers would be coming back from on top of the mountain, you know what, I'd always say, how much further is it? And the funny thing, sometimes we'd get frustrated with them. I'd get frustrated because they cannot sit there and say it's exactly 2,847 feet. They don't know how much further it is. They can't tell me it's 15 minutes because they don't know how fast or slow I walk. They can't say it's two hours. They don't know if I'm going to jog or if I'm going to crawl on the ground. They just always say it's not much further. You're almost there. I've got to tell you, folks, some of them lied to me. Amen? <laughs> we were not almost there. You know I ended up with blisters on my feet and it made somewhat of a miserable trip, but I did make it to the top. I kept thinking in my mind, I thought, you know what? Five years from now, ten years from now, when the picture is being passed around of my family, those on the journey, when that picture is being passed around, I didn't want them to take and say, where's your dad at? Well, he stopped on the trail back along the way there. He's too much of a sissy to make the trip. I wouldn't let him do that, Brother Whalen. I wouldn't do it. And no matter how bad the blisters hurt, I persevered. I made it at the top. I have my goofy picture taken, ugly as ever, amen. But I completed the journey and got back. My feet are almost healed up from it. But beloved, the point being that I fear that there are times that Christians will come to the point that we feel like I'm just going to stop beside the trail and let everybody else go ahead. There in Numbers chapter number 32... <laughs> The part of that that we did not go on to read is the part where Moses ended up giving those folks a good lecture and said, you know what, you're going to discourage the hearts of the children of Israel. You have the attitude, this land is a place for cattle, this land has plenty of grass, and you're just going to stop here and you're not going to pass on over. And Moses ended up giving them a good lecture. But you know, the main point that Moses made was, you're going to discourage the hearts of other people. You'll discourage them if you decide to quit before the race is done. Beloved, I fear that there may be people at times, even in our midst, who have quit before the race is done. You've come to the point that you feel like, you know what, the journey's just been too long. I give up. 
I'm throwing in the towel. Yeah, I'm still bodily in the place where I need to be. Yeah, I'll still shake my head to something positive in a message. Yes, I'll still sing the songs as we sing them. But I give up. You know what? Your choice to give up, it does not just impact you, but it impacts every member of this assembly. Because other people look at you and they sit back and say, well, they gave up. I mean, look how strong they are. They're an experienced runner. They're an experienced hiker. They're an experienced Christian. And you know what? If after all the years of them serving the Lord, they came to the place that they gave up, what's the point of me even trying? Why should I even try? Beloved, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Brother Ardry, if you'll come.